chair the first session. So, welcome everyone. Uh, we will start uh, straight ahead um, with uh, talk by um, Dr. Charles D. Simone, who is from Ludwig Maximilians Universität in uh, Munich. Um, Dr. Di Simone studied in Berkeley uh, originally, and did an MA, and then joined uh, the University of Munich to work under the guidance of um, Professor Jens Uwe Hartmann on a very long time project that has been um, mobilizing a lot of energy in Munich over the past uh, decade. Uh, namely, the edition of a very important manuscript of uh, the Dirga Agama, uh, being so the collection of long discourses as uh, transmitted uh, in Sanskrit by a particular school of Buddhism called Mula Sarastivada. And um, so we have uh, um, 35 uh, minutes that are allowed for, allocated for this talk, so I will ask uh, Charles and uh, the following speakers to try and stick to 25 minutes or so. To, to leave some room for, for discussion. Without further ado. And, um, in the corner, yeah. Stand for John Berkeley. Ah, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Good morning, everybody. Thank, thank you for having me. I appreciate coming. I've never been to London before except for the airport, so. It's an experience. Whatever reality lies behind a popular vision of Buddhist monasticism in ancient and middle-aged South Asia that may include images of monks and nuns engaging in various forms of meditative asceticism focused on soteriological goals, this, the historic fact remains that literature, both memorized and, one sec, I, want, I should put a stopwatch on because there's no timer. Literature, both memorized and written, played a large role in the everyday life of those living in monastic communities. Buddha Vachana, the speech of the Buddha, was foremost among the literature available to the Buddhist community, and it was in sutras that the core of the religious teachings was laid out, justifying the doctrines that the community practiced. These sutras were collected in Agama or Nikaya collections in all of the major mainstream Buddhist schools. Of particular importance in terms of defending Buddhist doctrines, against non-Buddhists was the Dirgagama, or collection of long discourses. Uh, the the Gilgit Dirgagama manuscript is a Mula Sarvastivada text containing a collection of ancient canonical Buddhist sutras composed in Sanskrit with some Prakrit elements and written on birch bark folios in the Gilgit Bamiyan type two script, also known as Proto Sharada. This collection had been lost for centuries and was recently rediscovered in what is thought to be the border area of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, in the late 20th century. It is a long and often highly fragmentary manuscript consisting of 47 texts and is still in the process of being edited by several different scholars. It was the work of a scriptorium copied Here's a scriptorium copied by, this is a Jain scriptorium for the conference. Although the people copying are North Indian Brahmins, not Jains. Uh, it was the work of a scriptorium copied by five to seven scribes who often engaged in, in the unusual practice of working together by trading folios back and forth. The Dirgagama corresponds to the Diganikai of the Theravada tradition preserved in Pali and the Chang'an Jing of the Dharmaguptaka tradition preserved in Chinese, while the Dirgagama, Diganikai, and Chang'an Jing often parallel one another, there are numerous differences in the three collections and the three collections often disagree on topics and content. Within the sutra collection and its corresponding collections from the other traditions, we find various characters beyond Gautama and his many friendly interlocutors who are generally monks of his order, woven throughout the sutras. These, these other characters are often Anyatirtika Parivrajikas, wanderers who are adherents of another faith, real or hypothetical ones conjured by Gautama in rhetorical debates, who provide conflict in the narrative by questioning the logic of Buddhist doctrines or the spiritual realization of the Buddha himself. 
Although this collection was quite probably originally used for the purpose purposes of proselytization or re rebutting arguments from non-Buddhists by showing the superior merits of Buddhist doctrine, the arguments employed would not be convincing in the slightest to anyone who was not already a believer in the Buddhist faith. Upon first glance, the beginnings of the Prasadika and Prasadhaniya Sutras, now edited and translated for the first time, appear to introduce texts with disparate themes and concerns, sharing similarity only in their titles. However, these two paired sutras from the Yuganapata of the Dirgagama, set near the end of the Buddha's career, are directly related, related in setting forth the Mula Sarvasti Bhattin positions on what makes a teacher and his doctrines successful. Both texts assume the format of a debate. The Prasadika Sutra takes the shape of a hypothetical debate where Gautama repeatedly offers, if some non-Buddhist were to say that, you should say this in, in reply, types of hypothetical situations. The Prasadhaniya Sutra revolves around an actual debate in the narrative between Gautama and Shariputra, with Gautama questioning the depth of Shariputra's lion's roar about the supremacy of the Buddha regarding Sambodhi. Although, even if the narrative structure takes, play, takes the shape of a debate, the stakes are quite low in both texts as the possibility that other religious leaders or their doctrines could exceed the Buddha or his doctrines is never taken seriously. Several schools of thought, some of which that are no longer ex existent, are represented in these texts, but the Jains, referred to as the Nigrantas, are employed as the chief example, with the Prasadika Sutra revolving around Mahavira's death in the resulting and the resulting chaos that ensued within the Jain monastic community. These Angatirtikas, who were seldom if ever encountered by the Mula Sarvastivada monks at the time of the copying of the Dirgagama manuscript, had become something akin to imaginary spirits of old adversaries arguing the positions from positions no longer relevant or perhaps even understood by the Buddhists of the era. It is in the Prasadika Sutra that we see the bulk of the rhetoric around the views of non-Buddhist groups. While the Prasadhaniya Sutra builds on the groundwork laid in the Prasadika and then goes into further detail on the superiority of Gautama and his doctrines. Uh, although the sutras are antagonistic to all non-Buddhist ideas, it is the Jains that serve as the name foils to which the Buddha Gautama contrasted, contrasts their inadequacy to the, with the supremacy of Buddhist doctrine. In fact, the narrative of the Prasadika Sutra begins with a novice Chunda witnessing the death of Nyantiputra. As, not, as Mahavira is called throughout the text in the city of Papa. Uh, this is the Sanskrit, I'll give the translation. Just then the Nigrata, Nigranta Nyatiputra had died in the monsoon residence in Papa. With, the, with his death, the Nati, Nigrantas, the followers of Nyatiputra, dwelt split, became divided, contentious, quarrelsome, aggressive, and fallen into dispute. Saying, in this manner, I know the doctrine and the discipline you do not know the doctrine and discipline. I know the doctrine and discipline in such a way. You know the doctor, doctrine and discipline in such a way. My understanding is consistent, yours is inconsistent. Mine is coherent and yours is incoherent. One said after what is to be said before, another said before what is to be said after. Further saying, what you have adhered to is totally refuted. Your theory has been taken up for the sake of argument. For release from this argument, cast it aside, you are rebuked. Reveal if you know the answer. You've been asked, speak. In this way, they strike and injure one another with sharp words. They accuse, and then there's an ellipse because we have a damage in the manuscript. Even their speech is not especially understood by one who is in agreement with doctrine. Even those who are white-clad householder disciples of the Nirgranta Nyatiputra, they reside feeling revulsion, aversion, disagreement, and deviation towards the Nirgrantas, towards the followers of Nyatiputra, who dwell split, are divided, contentious, quarrelsome, aggressive, and fallen into dispute, obviously because of this doctrine and discipline that is ill-proclaimed, poorly imparted, not conducive to emancipation, not leading to perfect awakening, broken, without cohesion, unreliable. The teacher is not a Tathagata, an Arha, a complete and perfect Buddha. After seeing the state of the Jain community upon the death of their leader, Chunda thinks to inform Ananda, who in turn decides they should go directly to Gautama, who is an old man himself and not long for the world. Hearing of Nyatiputra's death, Gautama uses the, uses the news to preach a sermon on the nature of why an, an adequate teacher, that is to say a Buddha, is needed for any set of doctrines to be viable. Gautama explains to Chunda that a disciple who cor correctly practices an ill-proclaimed doctrine and discipline, a dharma and vinaya, espoused by one who is not a Buddha, is blameworthy, as is the teacher and the doctrine, while a disciple who, is, who does not practice an ill-proclaimed 
doctrine correctly is praiseworthy. Conversely, a disciple who incorrectly practices a well-proclaimed doctrine espoused by a Buddha is blameworthy. While the teacher and the doctrine are praiseworthy and the disciple who practices a well-proclaimed doctrine is praiseworthy. Why is the doctrine and discipline of the Nirguntas ill-proclaimed and poorly imparted, etc.? Although it is not explicitly stated, it is clear from Gautama's explanation that the fault lies directly with Nyatiputra, who, because he was not a Buddha, inherently taught inferior doctrines. It should be noted that at no point are the doctrines of the Nirguntas ever made clear or compared to those of the Buddhists. This would appear to be beside the point, as it would seem that the fact that, they're, that they are not the doctrine and discipline of Gautama is enough to forever damn them. Beyond their prominence in the frame story, the Nirguntas are not mentioned by name again within either sutra. Although we no longer hear of the Jains, Anyatirtika Parivrajikas appear quite regularly in the role of hypothetical interlocutor to Gautama, so that he can illustrate to his disciples the correct way to answer those questioning his doctrines. And the next non-Buddhist doctrines to be singled out are the Brahmanic doctrines of Udrika Ramaputra, one of Gautama's former teachers. The discussion of Ramaputra is prefaced by an almost haughty statement as to his status as a teacher. Certainly Chunda, certainly Chunda, insofar as there are those regarded as teachers, I do not consider even a single teacher equal to myself, one who is thus endowed with the highest game and the high, highest gain and the highest fame. Now I am just such, such, a, such a teacher. Certainly, Chunda, insofar as there are communities or multitudes or assemblies, I do not consider even a single assembly of disciples to be equal with myself. That which is thus endowed with the highest gain and the highest fame. Now I have just such a community of monks. Therefore, Chunda, one should truly have recourse to the community of monks and the teacher. As for Gautama's estimation of Ramaputra's doctrine of seeing one does not see, which would appear to be related to pre-Buddhist concepts of meditation focused on attempts to have control over one's awareness while not being aware in any focused way, Gautama castigates Ramaputra's analogy in the, of the flat of the blade and the edge of a razor by extension, as, by extension and by extension his teachings on the whole as inferior and goes on to correct Ramaputra's aphorism of seeing one does not see, reframing it in terms of fulfilling Buddhist doctrine. Monks, saying it properly, they should say, seeing he does not see. In this case, seeing it properly, they should say, why is this? And then ellipse. The holy life is fulfilled by this perspective. Thinking, I will fulfill that perspective, he does not see it. Thinking, the holy life is per perfected in every way he sees it. Certainly, the holy life that is perfected in every way is perfect by this perspective. Thinking, having removed that perspective, I will include another more perfect pers perspective. In that way, it is more something, unfortunately, he and he does not see what that something is. The last example of non-Buddhist doctrines I'll discuss, or I'll mention today, occurred towards the end of the Pasadika Sutra, when Gautama states that he has correctly explained all views associated with the beginning and the end of existence for Vanta and Aparantaha, and goes on to explain how they are incorrectly stated by other groups of ascetics or brahmanas. Incorrect views regarding the beginning concerned concerning the, etern the et eternality of the self and the world, eternality of the self and suffering, the creation of the self and the world, and the creation of self and suffering. Gautama restates these incorrect views about the beginning, and after confirming that some ascetics and brahmanas actually hold such views, explains that he does not accept them because different ascetics and brahmanas hold different opinions and there is no consensus, which is a rather weak uh, reason not to accept them. Incorrect views regarding the end of existence concern the samnivada, asamnivada, naiva samni, na samni, or naiva samni, asamnivada, uchedavada, and the drishtadharma and nirvanavada views. Gautama restates these incorrect views about the end, and after confirming that some ascetics and brahmanas actually hold such views, explains that he does not accept them because different ascetics and brahmanas hold different views and there is no consensus. Gautama then explains that he has approached those who hold such views and asking them if they really believe their doctrines and then gives his reasons for rejecting them. That Anyatirtikas and the views they hold would be held in a rather low regard in Buddhist sutras is not surprising. However, the consistent lack of any evidence of thorough knowledge of the doctrines marks the sutras in the Dirgagama as separate from the sort of doctrinal or doxographical arguments 
in commentarial and philosophical literature as seen in texts such as the Abhidharma Kosha of Vasubandhu and the commentaries to his work by the likes of Yashomitra and Stirmati, all three of whom were associated with the Sarvastivada tradition. This apparent lack of interest in the actual content of the Anyatirtika views fits in quite well with our understanding of the Virgagama as a text meant for proselytization. If one's goal is selling your own views and community as to, to as broad an audience as possible, then a nuanced ex examination of competing groups is perhaps not the best course of action. However, based on the nature of the comp composition of the manuscript, it has become clear that by the time of its copying, the Mul Sarvastivadins did not have any competition among the Anyatirtikas that would necessitate any strong outreach, and the purpose of the text had probably shifted to one of canonical completeness. There are numerous errors in the content of the manuscript that may indicate either careless copying of the scribes in its production or that this manuscript is a product of a long copying tradition where multiple errors were introduced over many years of copying. Whatever the case may be, it seems that the copyists either were not familiar with the content of the sutras or did not take the time to check their work thoroughly. It has been hypothesized that this manuscript was made either for the meritorious act of sutra copying, a religious activity in the history of Buddhism, or for the sake of maintaining a monastic library and was almost surely not intended to be used for study. Interestingly, there is evidence that the birch bark folios of the manuscript had been carefully repaired before the sutras were copied onto the manuscript. Seven aksharas into folio 295 verse 8, there is a birch bark patch that is clearly seen to be pasted on top of the manuscript. Instead of the content of the sutra, six filler marks are written on the patch. Filler marks appear regularly in the manuscript, especially where the birch bark is warped or otherwise unsuitable to write on. However, the patch to the manuscript does not appear to be faulty. The only reason for the filler marks seems to be to indicate that the damage had been repaired. In fact, it, is most, it was most likely affixed to the folio before the yakshas were copied, as we can see that the bottom of the vocalagar from Raha Kritam in line six has been written onto the patch where it is extended onto the space before the conjunct akshara. You can get that, it's okay. The repair to the manuscript here has even affected the akshara account for the line of the final six akshras are added interlinearly underneath the bottom of the line in order to maintain the fidelity of the akshara account for the sake of copying the folios. These patches, which I have witnessed used in several instances throughout the manuscript, suggest that the manuscript was copied, was considered to be of some importance as an object, and that the content of the manuscript was perhaps of only a secondary concern. The greatest relationship between the two texts is that they share the theme of the nature of teachers and the importance of placing one's faith in a proper teacher, that is to say, the Buddha. Being, a, being set at a period when the possibility of a Buddhism without a Buddha was looming on the horizon, both sutras are concerned with establishing the supremacy of the Buddhist faith over others to nullify any doubts that may arise among the faithful. The Prasadika Sutra implicitly states that while the Nagrantas fell into dispute after their founder's death, the Buddhist doctrines are complete, and as long as they are memorized and conveyed correctly, they can, there cannot be any confusion even without a Buddha. The Pseudonia Sutra takes pains to show how the founder of Buddhism is supreme above all others with explicit purpose being to inspire the faithful. The two sutras accomplish their task of promoting Gautama's doctrines by denigrating those of non-Buddhist ascetics. Their portrayal of these non-Buddhist ascetics exists not as an accurate record of their practices and doctrines, but rather as a common narrative trope whose purpose is solely to further the narrative providing conflict and serving as foils for Gautama, who disproves their views while legitimizing his own. Thank you. Um, do you want to stay here, or are you going to take seats and answer questions? Um, I can have a, have a seat. So we have plenty of time for questions. Um, and I would like to thank very much uh, uh, Dr. De Simone uh, for his very clear talk and very um, interesting introduction to also uh, the problem of textual transmission that are and, and the material issues that rise um, when uh, when someone studies uh, a very early manuscript like like the Virgagama. 
And uh, maybe to open the discussion, I, I was uh, wondering whether you could say a bit more about, because you, you, you made a, a careful assessment of the representation of the Nyaferti Irtikas in the particular sutras that you edited. And um, maybe if you can speak a bit more on about how you, uh, you perceive this kind of representation within the border context of uh, Dirgagama, or, because the long discourses have a lot to say about what means, but about the Anyatirtikas in general. Mm -hmm. And how do you see this picture fits with other sutras transmitted within this particular connection, but also beyond, so in, for example, in the Diganikaya, etc. Do you, do you see something very peculiar in this, part, in, this, uh, in this text, or is it consistent with, uh, with the, um, the broader representation of the Tirtikas in, in early canonical writings? Um, how do you mean by consistent? Do you mean, is there any, uh, but I mean, is, that, is there any, for example, the, the, um, the, um, the particular motif that introduced the story seems very, uh, um, it's, it's very interesting because it refers to, to some kind of, uh, historical memory, whether it is literally constructed or not, about, about the particular events. And this particular event is also referred in other sources, right? Uh, uh, this, the death of Nyatiputra is in the Sangiti Sutta, and then one other, uh, Majamanakaya. Um, it's, uh, the Sangiti the Sutra actually, they, it's possible that it was composed from this, uh, event from the Pasadika where they say you should recite or it's just it's saying what you've learned. Um, it's fairly consistent in the Diganekai and the Dirgagama and the Chanaham Jin. There's sort of these differences in terms of how the uh, rebukes that the Jains are giving to one another are. Like the Dirgagama strays from the Diganekai uh, quite a bit. And unfortunately, the Sangeeti Sutra, like uh, the Central Asian Sanskrit version is very damaged here, and the Dirgagam was very damaged here at the very beginning, mm -hmm. and the folios were actually fused together in the bundle, like you saw those three, fo the bun three fo folio bundles from the rare bookshop. And this was one large pile that was sort of ripped apart, and the places where it's ripped, the upper layers are very much stuck together so you can't read like the verso of one folio because it's stuck to the recto. So the parts that are the same are sort of recorded in all, all three versions, but the parts that are different are unfortunately lost in the Sanskrit. So there's mm -hmm. sort of kind of leaves us sort of lingering on what they wanted to say that we don't know right now. Okay, thank you. So we can take uh yeah, probably five, uh, five questions or so. So if there is any, any question, uh, please raise your hand. Peter? Well, the Buddhists were very concerned with how, and this is a late sutra in, I mean, who can say, you know, when they were, they were written after the Buddha had died, but uh, if it was preached, it was preached late in the Buddha's career, and there was a concern of what happens after a Buddha is gone. So you have like Arta and Vyanjana, and sort of the meaning and the, the literal meaning and the spirit of these, of the Dharma and the Vinaya. And there was concern that, and they talk about this in some detail in the text, if you have some of the Arta, but not, or some of the Vyanjana, you're not quite there, and you, but you very politely say to a monk, like the Buddha saying, if, if you meet other monks and they, they know the meaning, but they don't know the spirit, or they know the spirit, but they don't know the meaning, very politely say, actually, it's this. And so you remember it properly in the future, but because the, the canon has to be complete, or the doctrine has to be complete. And when Nyatiputra died, I mean, the Jains might disagree on this, but when Nyatiputra died, their group fell apart because people said, I remember it this way, you remember it this way. And of course, after the Buddha died, the same thing happened. Um, 
in the Prasadaniya Sutra, for example, we have the main interlocutor as Shariputra. And this, you could see this sort of displaying a sort of tension um, within the Buddhist community because Shariputra is foremost in wisdom and he would be, if Gautama dies, which he will, maybe Shariputra should be, you know, the new Buddha. But the text is quite clear that no, this can't be. And Shariputra, they, so we have Shariputra as the mouthpiece saying, after the Buddha, well, he doesn't say after the Buddha dies, but he says, there can only be one Buddha in the past. There's been a Buddha in the future, there'll be a Buddha. There can never be two. And after the Buddha dies, that's it until we have a, a new Lokadatu. And you have to have faith in the Buddha. That, so to have Shariputra say this really allays these sort of, um, you could see this courtly intrigue almost, um, you know, usurpers. And later we have Devadatta who was actually trying to usurp and, and it didn't end well for him either. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Michael. Um, it's something like around 700 to 1000 CE by radiocarbon dating, uh, or six, 654 or something. So seventh or eighth century. So this is, it's uh, not you know an early manuscript, but it's not a late manuscript either. And it's, uh, at a time when sort of these Agama texts weren't really, um, they weren't really within the zeitgeist of the Mula Srivastivadans at this point, I would say. Could maybe add that the, the script that is used in this particular Agama is the same as the Mula Savastivada Vinaya that was found. Yeah, so in, in the same I mean, this is basically probably, similar. Yeah. This is probably one of, from the same cache as the Gilga texts, but it was found, well, maybe it was found at the same time and just stayed in someone's basement, we don't know. No, that's, um, there's some, I mean, I'm not an expert on Jainism, but I know like um, what uh, Ian Gardner wrote an article recently suggesting that probably not so many Jains in the greater Gandhara area. And it would seem that these Jain doctrines were just sort of like old, old stories sort of like that you just keep, you sort of roll out to say, remember when we beat those guys and look how great we are. Um, if people were even reading this text, which it doesn't seem likely that this particular manuscript was actually being actively used, used as a text to be read. Please, Louis, you had the, ah, sorry. Oh, there, there was a question by Louis and then, uh, ah, Professor Kalimiba. Um, yeah, please. I mean, it's, it's difficult to say because you only have, especially with this manuscript, it's divorced from its fine location. So we don't really know, we can only hypothesize, but based on the paleographical analysis, it's, you see that it was probably just uh, scribes just copying and we don't know, we don't know why. And we don't know if it was in a library or if it was someone someone commissioned them to um, you know create this particular text because it was important for a certain person or family or something. The scribes might have been Buddhist. They might not have been Buddhist. We don't know. So paratextual materials, nothing that comes to mind. Um, Professor Van Inver. Do you know where it was found? Most likely in the area of the Sandra Sandra. Oh, is it? Okay. No one.
right. Right, they say, but. And do you know what year this was that he, he says this happened? So sometime in the 90s, I would assume. Yeah. It was 98 when it was, when Kazunobu found it. But was it in the 90s or was it in like the 80s even that, that he. Okay, that's impressive. This is some high information, everybody. <laughs> and many, many of these manuscripts have very fascinating journeys, huh? to, uh, from their very obscure caches to, yeah. um, to the desk of, uh, of the philologist. Uh, are there any other questions? There's one over there, but maybe you've thought better of it. Huh. Yeah, well, that certainly speaks with my own research. Where, where does it state that? It's one of the chain of secrets, one of those giant secrets that huh. and and Yeah, I would, I would love to. Do you happen to know why? They're specifically the Mulus Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk after. I'd love to hear about that. Very good. Um, so maybe we can move on to the next paper. So we'll, uh, we started a bit late, uh, so we can catch up a bit uh, with, uh, uh, with this time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zimmerman. And now it's time to welcome uh, Dr. Christopher Keechapel from uh, Loyola Marymount University. I never had the pleasure to meet him, so I don't have much to to introduce him, but uh, I look forward to his paper on uh, the conversion of Jaina woman to the Buddhist past according to the Pali Canon. So it's good to meet Charles because there are two LMUs in the world and one of them's in Germany and the other one is in Los Angeles. And if you Google LMU, you don't know what part of the world you may end up. The work that I've put together for today depends upon the Terigata as its primary source. And the Terigata tells stories of early Buddhist nuns, and two apparently had been members of Jain religious orders before converting to Buddhism. Bada Kundalakesa, who had been born, quote, into a financier's family, we're not sure if it was actually a Jain family, though it might have been, had trained as a Jain nun, eventually became a master of debate, traveling from village to village as a religious teacher. She encountered Sariputra and converted to Buddhism. The second nun, Nandutara, had been born into a Brahmin family and then followed the path of Jain asceticism. She similarly became skilled in debate and became a Buddhist nun after an encounter with Moggallana. A third woman, Visaka, married to a Jain merchant, became a significant donor to the Buddhist Sangha. And this 
talk, we'll speculate how these three narratives characterize from a Buddhist perspective early conversations between Buddhists and Jains. In the early histories of Buddhism and Jainism, we are blessed with the literary presence of several named women. And my other world is the world of Christian theology in which I've had some training and do some teaching. And this is one of the great laments. We have Ruth, we have Esther, we have a handful of women from the, from the Hebrew Bible. Again, Mary Magdalene, Mary Mother of God, and a few other named women, but very few and far between, far between compared to the number of men who are named. On the Buddhist side, we have the names and stories of the Buddha's mother, his stepmother and wife, Maya Mahapajapati and Yashodara, and the stories of many other women are preserved in the Terigata, including Tisa, Sumana, Upasama, Mita, a different Visaka, Uttara, and Sangha, who had been members of the royal harem, and Sundari Nanda, daughter of Mahajapati, um, the Buddha's aunt, the woman who raised him, and this woman, um, Sundari Nanda, is the Buddha's half-sister. Additionally, more than 50 nuns are named and described in the Terigata, and eight or nine are declared to have been arhats. On the Jain side, many names and stories from the early period can be found. These include, according to this Phaetambara, the first person to achieve freedom, Marudevi, mother of the first Tirtankara, Urshaba or Adinat. Adinat's two daughters, Brahmi and Sundari, who reportedly invented writing and mathematics. In the Ashtapad Temple in Hastinapur, they are displayed in a place of great prominence along with their hundred brothers. Another woman named prominently in the early material is Malinat. According to the Svatambara, she was the 19th Tirtankara and the only woman Tirtankara. Rajimati, the betrothed of Neminat, the 22nd Tirtankara, who, repulsed by the wedding feast preparations, renounced on his way to get married, as did his fiancée. And now we're, we're sort of veering into more mythic material, but Padmavati, the former queen who, in the form of a snake, was rescued by Parshvana with her husband, and the two of them later saved Parshvana from drowning. And also from the time of Parshvana, Pushpachula, who headed the order of nuns, the Aryakas, during the time of Parshvana, the 23rd Tirtankara. And then finally, and Whitney Kelting has written quite a bit about Chandana, the imprisoned princess who fed Mahavira and later became a nun and the head of 36,000 sadvis. 1,400 of whom are said to have attained perfect knowledge and liberation. Now, one major difference can be found between these two traditions, and here it's a little bit about the reception and the continuation of text production. In the case of the Buddhism, the Terigata, the songs of the Teris, the songs of the elder women, the Terigata was preserved from the time of the development of the Buddhist canon. It was composed, memorized, and eventually written in the Pali language using the literary convention of the shloka, a verse of 32 verses, four sets of eight syllables. And I actually dreamt last night of these being sung in harmony and counterharmony, as one will find in a Thai temple. And as was said earlier, do these people even know what they're saying? But the remarkable thing is that these uh, texts continue to be memorized and recited and transmitted. And the, um, the recitation is actually quite entrancing. Now, by contrast, the giant canon did not survive the great migration caused by famine some 2,300 years ago at which time Jainism split into two current major groupings, the Svetambara and the Dagambara, 
And as we heard a little bit earlier in the same actually was true of the Buddhists as well, there uh, were very many differences between these various schools, in the case of Jainism, these two schools, and specifically on um, the status of women. Hence the narratives that provide the foundation for the, the, the Jain aspect of this paper largely arise from lore in texts accepted exclusively by the Svetambaras, not the Dagambaras, and their antiquity is not as certain as is the antiquity of the narratives from the Terigata. Though the Svetambara and the Dagambara do agree on the core principles as found in the Tavarta Sutra, each developed its own commentarial traditions even on the, Tava, uh, the Tavarta Sutra and take variant philosophical interpretations and particularly in regard to women. And of course, Pabhanabhjani's gender and salvation gives us the full picture in that regard. Hence, of what's been put forward, the older identifiable source is the Terigata. This was deemed to be part of the Kudika Nikaya, or the miscellaneous discourses. These miscellaneous discourses also include the Apadana, which is another important source regarding Buddhist women. And these texts probably reached their written form about 2,100 years ago. However, this part of the canon was not for export, and the miscellaneous discourses did not make it into East Asia, um, but remained exclusively in, in the Pali. Now, while the oldest Jaina text, the Acharanga Sutra, which is about 300 BC, does make mention of the order of nuns, it does not include specific narratives to the detail that we'll hear from the Tarigata about individual nuns. The Kalpa Sutra remains similarly mute on the details regarding nuns, but nonetheless names the women who headed the orders, whose responsibilities, in fact, and if we think about this, were greater than their corresponding male counterparts, simply due to the number of persons to be uh, overseen. Under Mahavira, Chandana oversaw, as we heard, 36,000 nuns, while Sulasa and Revati oversaw 318,000 female lay votaries. Under Parshvanath, Pushpachula oversaw 38,000 nuns, and Suvrata oversaw 327,000 lay women. And under Urshaba, the first Tirthankara, Brahmasundari supervised 300,000 nuns, and Subhadra supervised 554,000 lay female devotees. Now, were these real numbers? Um, some musicologists would say otherwise, that they have to do with ratios and tuning systems, but let's just say that there were a large number of women that were supervised by religious authorities and that it can be surmised that there was a greater number, we know, a greater number of nuns than there were of, of monks, greater number of female followers in total than there were male followers. So the women had great responsibility. Now I want to talk um, quickly about the stories of three women. The first is Bada Kundalakesa. She was born into a wealthy family in Rajgirha, the town between Alanda and Gaya on the Nemdura River. It has a wonderful um, like ski lift to take you up to the top of the mountain near there now. And one day, sitting in her window, she was glancing out and saw this handsome young man being led away to his execution. And she begged her father to arrange for his release, and she married him promptly. And even though his father was a Brahmin at the court, he himself was not an honorable man, and he was being put to death, apparently for good reason, as his wife later found out. But as um, sometimes happens, the place where he was to be executed had a life of its own, 
and it had taken a promise from him, uh, from this rogue um, man called Satuka, that if he was spared, he would make an offering to the cliff itself. So he told his new wife, um, Varakundalesika, that he needed to go to this cliff and make an offering and please, would she get some money together to make an offering to the cliff? Once they got to the cliff, she got very, very afraid because she could tell he was up to no good. He became very, very cold. And she realized that he was about to push her off the cliff, take her, her jewels and get out of, you know, escape into freedom. And he called her a fool, demanded that she hand her jewels over to him, and she outsmarted him. She said, oh, please, give me one last good embrace. And she embraced him from the front, and then she embraced him from the back, and she pushed him over the cliff, and he died. And the cliff spoke up, and the cliff said, bravo and praised her keen presence of mind. Wisdom is not always confined to men. A woman too is wise and shows it now and then. Now Kundalakesa was deeply embarrassed by her error, first in marrying and then being forced to kill this man. And she could not return to her family. She joined the order of Jain nuns. She removed all of her hair and eventually mastered all of the Jain teachings. She then left the formal constraints of the Jain path and wandered from town to town, inviting people to engage in religious debate. While in each town, she stuck a rose apple branch and a pile of sand and then dared anyone to enter into conversation. And with this, she gained quite a reputation as an interlocutor for all who were interested in philosophical matters. Once, while in Sabati, up north, near Kapilavastu, Sariputra, close disciple of the Buddha, accepted the challenge. Bada put her questions first, and Sariputra answered each of these with ease. And then Sariputra asked her, one, what is that? And she was stumped. Okay, if any of you can answer that, it's a good riddle. Okay, what is one? And she be asked to become his pupil, but he referred her to the Buddha. And hearing his words, it is said that she gained instant enlightenment, that she became an arhat right there, receiving her first darshan with the Buddha. And the Buddha saw it immediately and said, come, Bhadha. And this was highly unusual because most, both male, but particularly female entrants to the order had to go through a long process of petition. And in the Terigata, we get her own words. And this is what she says. It's both autobiographical and philosophical. I cut my hair. This is a portion of it. I cut my hair and wore the dust. And I wandered in my one robe, finding fault where there was none, and finding no fault where there was. Then I came from my rest one day at Vulture Peak and saw the pure Buddha with his monks. I bent on my knee, paid homage, pressed my palms together. We were face to face. Come, Bada, he said. That was my ordination. I have wandered through Anga and Magadha, Vaji, Kashi, and Kosala. Fifty-five years with no debt, I have enjoyed the alms of these kingdoms. And then this is a very touching end. She says, a wise lay follower gained a lot of merit. He gave a robe to Bada, who was free from all bonds. So simple. This poem conveys her asceticism, 
Her critique, seemingly of what to her perhaps was an extreme practice, her conversion to Buddhism, her ascent as a Buddhist teacher, and her gratitude to those who lent her support in five differing kingdoms. Alice Collette, a scholar here in England, devotes an entire chapter of her new book, which I commend to you, Lives of Early Buddhist Nuns, to the conversion of Vada to Buddhism. She provides a synoptic view of the many places in which this story is told, including two Jataka tales, the Dhammapada, and even in Jain texts. Ranjani Obiasekara has translated a Sinhalese version of her story as found in the Siddharma Retina Valaya, and both Anne Monius at Harvard and Leslie Orr at Concord University have um, commented that the Buddha Lakesha story has served as inspiration throughout Tamil Nadu uh, for the long-standing tradition of female orators there. There's a Tamil Buddhist text, now lost, called the, the Kuntik Keshi, which is about um, this woman. But the, the Jain counterpart survives, which is called the Nilakeshi, and it reverses the story and says that eventually Kundalakeshi ran into a Jain women debater, and the Jain nun defeated her in debate. Now, the next story, a little bit shorter here, is Nandutara. A similar tale in some ways, but this woman we know originally was a Brahmin. She converted to Jainism and like Bada Kundalakesa, became renowned and traveled around India with a rose apple bow in hand, challenging anyone to religious debate. She encountered the learned Buddhist monk Moggallana and converted. Her poem, translated by Susan Murcott, conveys her conversion from Brahmanical Hinduism to Jainism and then from Jainism to Buddhism. She says, I used to worship fire, the moon, the sun, and the gods. I bathed at fords and took many vows. Then I shaved my head and slept on the ground and did not eat after dark. Other times, I used to love makeup and jewelry and baths and perfumes, just serving my body obsessed with sensuality. The faith came. I took up the homeless life. <clears throat> Seeing the body as it really is, desires have been rooted out. Coming to birth is ended, and my cravings as well. Untied from all that binds, my heart is at peace. The precious ending, untying the knot of craving. Then the third woman I want to bring up is Visaka. The Buddha and the early Buddhists and even Peter here relies upon donors. And one of the most generous and well-known donors of Buddhism was a woman named Visaka, whose, na whose husband, Punavadana, was a wealthy Jain merchant from Savati. And Visaka herself was the granddaughter of Mendaka, a wealthy merchant from the city of Badia in Bimbisara's kingdom. And she was the daughter of Dhananjaya and Sumana. At the age of 16, she attended one of Buddha's talks during his visit to their city and converted to Buddhism. She then later married um, Punavadana, the son of Migara, a wealthy Jain merchant from Savati. And at the occasion of her wedding, and I love these details, her father commissioned an oversized piece of gold jewelry that extended from her head, and you can imagine a nose ring, sort of a, a, a crown and a veil and then an earring, and it goes all the way down to her feet, made of gold, silver, and jewels, including the depiction of a peacock. And even though her husband was Jane, her husband, Punavadana, was anxious not to offend in any way his wife's important family. 
and he allowed the Buddha and his monks to stay at his house when they visited. And then his own mother and father convert and become Buddhists. There's no mention, some of you may have variants on this story, that he actually converted. But nonetheless, he supported his wife, and his wife provided liberally for the monks of the Buddhist Sangha, donating food, medicine, and robes on a regular basis. She tried to sell that big hunk of jewelry, but no one would buy it. Uh, but she gave the equivalent amount of money uh, to build a seven-story vihara. And the story has that uh, the Buddha and his entourage often stayed in that particular vihara. She lost grandchildren and went into a place of deep sorrow. And the Buddha reminded her of the ephemerality of bodily existence. And this is a quote. Whatever of sorrow, lamentation, and pain there is in this world, all this arises from clinging. Where clinging is not, these are not. Therefore, happy and sorrowless are those who cling not to anything in the world. Set your affections on Set not your affections on the things of the earth. He gave her advice, and she gave him advice. And she said, you must be willing to ordain people during the rainy season, because that's when everybody comes and hangs out with the monks. And then there was another case, a rather touching story of a nun who, um, it turned out, was pregnant. And many in the Sangha wanted to expel her, but she said, on the behalf of the nun, no, she was pregnant, she didn't probably even know, and let her stay. So she was able to become a nun and uh, go to full term with the baby. So a couple of observations. Uh, one, given the level of detail in these stories, I think that they're quite accurate and not merely hagiographical. And in biblical criticism, there's form criticism and redaction criticism. The form criticism won't work too well here because everything became placed within this chantable, memorizable type of verse. Whereas in the Bible, the big issue is, was Jesus really as anti-Semitic as, as he seems to have been? And for two reasons, we know probably not. One, the word usage is different. It's more contemporary to when the, the Gospels were actually written. And redaction, which is the um, context, uh, was not appropriate to the time when the Buddha, when rather Jesus would have spoken those words, but would have been appropriate at the time when uh, Christianity was expanding through the Roman Empire and had to make itself palatable to Romans who didn't want to become Jews in order to be Christians. If that, you know, if you can follow that. And therefore, uh, there has to be something very distinct and timely about narrative in order for it to most likely be accurate. And with both poems and with the anecdotes associated with all of these women, there's nothing to say that there would be any reason to uh, contrive these narratives. Uh, and with what little we have of, of the Jain material, it appears um, quite a bit later. And yes, uh, there's all sorts of reasons why these stories would be developed of, of the Jain women in one particular sect and not the other, et cetera. So redaction criticism would say that ah, we can't really say that there's 100% historical accuracy just because the level of detail isn't even provided in the earliest level of the story. You need there's to also minutes. something very, okay, two minutes? Two minutes. Okay, so touching about um, the end of each of the poems, uh, Kundala Kesa's poem and of Nandutara's poem, is there something um, very real feeling and slightly self-deprecating about their um, reflections and, and self-awareness? 
No, just a, a couple of comments um, that modern scholars, and this is happening again and again, not only in regard to women, but in regard to Tantra, and one of the issues that everyone seems to say, oh, we need to pay more attention to Jainism, but not too many people get around to doing it. Uh, there's a, a new book on early Buddhist women by Pruti Raman Chaturvedi that completely neglects any mention that Visakha's husband was from a, a Jain family. And they just sort of gloss over and they actually say that Jainism isn't interesting um, to their study. Um, and then with Ranjani Ovayasekara's work, um, again, there, there's really no detail on Jainism. And a question comes up, did this just simply not get included in the later Sinhalese commentaries, um, the discussions of Jainism? Uh, and then to wrap up, um, I guess the winners write history in some ways, but as we know, uh, the Buddhists did not survive in India. The Jains did. And I'm echoing the words of Pabhanab Jaini in a sense, but why? Why did Buddhism disappear? Why did Jainism survive? And my last observation is with its firm moral code, the enduring presence of both nuns and monks, and the ongoing support of a wealthy laity, Jain asceticism has continued to be practiced in India into the present, recognizable then as now, by its distinct robes, the plucking of hair, the eschewal of high beds, and utmost care in all manner of eating. So, thank you. So thank you very much for this uh, very pleasant journey. I don't know if you want to stand or if you want to sit. Uh, you have the... I'll stand. Okay. Um, I would just like maybe to, to contribute a comment before I open the floor. Um, I found your, your, um, your journey very, very, actually very delightful, uh, very, um, very interesting and opening up to, to a world. But I would just insist, in my opinion, uh, this world uh, is very much literary. And uh, I think that a little bit of uh, philology and history wouldn't hurt. Uh, and in, partic in the, the particular case of the Terigata, uh, you seem to have basically collated uh, the early verses that might be extremely, uh, indeed very early, even if I would personally doubt as a French skeptic uh, <laughs> that they were you know, uh, found in a written form as we know it in the, before the Common Era. But then the, the narrative story, the narrative framework that actually sp speaks about uh, for example, Kundala Kesi becoming a nun is actually from the commentary mm -hmm. by Dhammapala, who is yeah. probably an eighth century author. Yeah. And so there is, uh, although we know that these verses were, they often contain the, the kernel of the story. Mm -hmm. And so it's quite clear that they circulated in oral form with some kind of a paratextual uh, story mm -hmm. that might be, in some cases, the kernel of which might be very old. Yeah. The received text, so if, we look, when, if you look, when you look at re, uh, reception history, the received text uh, that we can read on the, which, on, mm -hmm. on the basis of which uh, there is such a lush uh, amount mm -hmm. of details mm -hmm. uh, is actually fairly late. Uh, and so there is, in, that, in this respect, no particular motivation to prioritize Buddhist data over Jaina uh, sources because uh, they, are, they might be sometimes coeval or something like this. So they could be very well read together, uh, right. in my uh, humble opinion. Yeah, I agree with you on that. But even the, the root verse is so much more rich than what we have in the Jain material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the stories, we don't know for sure. But the emotion in the verses themselves, which seem to be quite old, I, I would still make this a similar argument, but of course not for the detail about the larger frame story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you, and uh, if there is any, any question, um, uh, Aruna. Yeah. So, uh, of course, we have some. 
No, Visaka was not Jane, no. Her husband, perhaps, and also with Budalakesa, her family might have been, because they were financiers, we don't know for certain, but it does seem that she did practice Jain asceticism. Any um, Professor Shoshnaki? I would love to know that, but I don't, I'm not sure. Does someone know Master of Debate, the, the poly for that, what that would have been? Um, I'd have to go back to, to the text and find. It's a very good question. Okay, we can check. Yes, please. Uh, so there is a question first there on the back, and then. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Chris. That was fascinating. Uh, I wonder if I can uh, focus on the link between wealth, uh, gender, and cultural preservation and bring it to a contemporary context. Mm. Good challenge. Okay, is there a, we still have maybe time for one question, uh, if there is a question. Yeah, uh, Peter. No, again, this would be from this later commentarial, and I'm, it's something I would love to search down a bit. Yeah. Okay. Maybe Humpener. Yes, please. Uh, sorry, you, you, you had a question. Uh, as you wish, but so we have, um, we would like to, we are already five minutes late, so we have maybe three, two, three minutes for the question. Okay. Yeah, please. Okay. <laughs> you are a performer. <laughs> I have made some observation. It's, uh, it is rightly said that the uh, greatest storytellers in the world are the Buddhists and Jains. The treasure trove of Jaina stories has some gems of conversion stories, of conversion from Buddhism to Jainism and the reverse of it, and from Brahmanism to Jainism. For instance, well, the Bruhat Katha Kosh in Sanskrit of Hari Arishena, the Kahakosu of Sri Chandra in Prakrit, and then the Kannada Vadaradhani. Very interesting stories are embedded in these works of conversion. And then among such stories, the story of Nilakeshi which you referred, Nilakeshi, is much more elaborate. The Nilakeshi, a Tamil poem, is entirely devoted to exemplify the accomplishments of the heroine who defeats all her opponents. The Nilakeshi, it is lost, it is not extant in Tamil, but corroborative stories are there in Pali 
and Sinhalese, which you referred. And then the Nelekesi is one of the rare works where we come across very lively dialogue, which reminds us of the unique dialogue in the Prakrit poem, Raya Paseniyam. Very interesting book, Willem Boli has written the story of Payesi. He has referred the dialogue, which we also come across in Greek literature. The Jaina poem, Nila Kesi, was written in order to retaliate Kundala Kesi, mm -hmm. a Buddhist work which unfortunately not extant. The original poem, Nila Kesi, and its commentary by Samaya Divakara Vamana Muni has been edited with English introduction by Professor A. Chakravarti Nainar in 1936. It is an important work for the comparative study of Jainism, Buddhism, and Ajivakism. We, we may remember the classic book by A.L. Basham, who wrote the Ajivakas, and Basham was working here in the SOAS, where we are celebrating the centenary year of SOAS, Padmanabh Jaini, and uh, then uh, Basham, they were working here at that period. And then, uh, Anuradhapura, you referred whether there was any uh, traces of uh, Jainism. Yes, uh, we have the written evidence from maybe one of the rare Pali works uh, uh, where it is said that Anuradhapura, there were many Jaina um, Vihara, something like that, which was patronized by the king who was ruling there in the third century BC. And then you... Probably time to conclude your intervention. Yes. Because, um, yeah, well, thank I'm, you I'm very sorry, but thank you very much for your contribution. Okay. And, um, <laughs> and um, now it's time to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Wu Chuen. Um, who coming from um, Leiden University. She actually did a, a PhD in, in the UK in Cardiff uh, with Max Degg, right, with Professor Degg. And now she's postdoctoral fellow at uh, the Leiden University Institute for Area Studies. And she has done um, fascinating work for a PhD on uh, the figure of Ajatashatru in both Buddhist and uh, Jaina sources. And she is now revising this for, for publication and she will present uh, a paper today, and uh, uh, the title that is actually on this uh, for, uh, on this uh, program is uh, is um, has to be updated. The, the the proper title is the Buddhist salvation of Ajatashatru and the Jaina uh, Jaina non salvation of Kunika. Please. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope uh, er, uh, the handouts uh, may be enough because I only prepared fifty copies. So if uh, you uh, don't get it hand out. Uh, uh, could you please share with your the person sitting next to you, and then uh, that will be great. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, the paper I'm presenting, the uh, title of the paper I'm presenting today is the the Buddhist salvation of Ajahn Shadru and the Jain non salvation of Kunika. Um, so if you got hand out, I just uh, start to read it. As a prominent contemporary of both the Buddha and the Mahavira, the Mughatan king, Ajat Shadlu, known to the Jains as Kunika, is widely featured in both Buddhist and Jain literature. Both Buddhist and the Jainas claimed him to be a supporter of their own religions. Both shared a common narrative that Ajat Shadlu Kunika, for the sake of the throne, imprisons his father, Bimbisara Shlanika, and consequently causes his death. Although the Buddhists spoke of Ajat Shadru's patricide and the Jainas spoke of Kunika's suicide, uh, as uh, Joseph Daly puts it, both traditions agree that Kunika used up the throne of Magata, whereby he at least toyed with the thought of uh, murdering his father and that Shnanika perished in uh, prison. The parallelism between Buddhist and the Jain accounts of Ajatashatru Kunika's conflict with his father has received much attention in previous studies. Rather less known and less exploited, however, is the fact that Buddhist and the Jains held considerably different opinions on the salvation of Ajatashatru Kunika, if we construe the term salvation in its ultimate sense referring to the liberation from samsara. 
Jan sources tell us nothing further than that Kunika is killed by a cave deity and falls into hell, whereas a number of Buddhist texts show that although Ajat Shatru, due to his patricide, will go to hell in, the in his next life, he will subsequently be released from hell and will eventually attain Parinirvana after becoming a political Buddha or a perfectly awakened Buddha. This paper seeks to understand how differently Buddhist and Jain storytellers in ancient India dealt with Ajata Shadra Kunika's saying or his bad karma and his salvation, and what we can learn from such differences about Buddhists and Jain themselves, especially regarding their karmic views and soteriological emphasis. I will first give an outline of the Indian Buddhist narrative cycle of the salvation of Ajata Shadru. Then I will turn to Jain sources discussing accounts of uh, Kunika's remorse over causing the death of his father and the accounts of his death and descent into hell. Finally, through comparing Buddhist and Jain story traditions, I will comment on the different roles Ajata Shadra Kunika plays in, in Buddhist and Jain sociological discourses. So let's begin with the Indian Buddhist narrative cycle of the celebration of Ajata Shadru. The image of Ajata Shadru that emerges from Indian Buddhist literature is a paradigmatic embodiment of both violence and virtue. He is both infamous as a committer of patricide, one of the five Alantalia crimes in entailing immediate karmic result of descending into hell in the next life, and famous as a model of Buddhist faith. As Professor Felix Granoff aptly puts it, Ajata Shadru is both vilified as the ultimate sinner who killed his father and conspired against the Buddha, and glorified as the greatest devotee of the Buddha, whose faith in the Buddha was so extraordinary that his minister had to prevent him from dying with grief on hearing the news of the Buddha's death. There is a very rich body of Buddhist literature, including both narrative and non-narrative sources, dealing at various, various levels of detail with Ajata Shadru's repentance, conversion, built rebirth, and slash all, his uh, inventory liberation. As well as narrative sources are concerned, the Indian Buddhist narrative cycle of the celebration of Ajata Shadru basically comprises five sub-cycles, including, first, the story of his repentance and conversion by the Buddha, that is, uh, the frame story of the Shlamyapala Sutra and its adaptations. Second, stories of his repentance and conversion by someone other than the Buddha. Third, stories of his conversion unrelated to his repentance for the patricide. Fourth, prophecies of his pro future rebirth and his uh, political Buddhahood. And fifth, prophecies of his future rebirth and his uh, Buddhahood. I have made a detailed study of these five sub-cycles else elsewhere, which is uh, my PhD thesis submitted to Cardiff University in 2012. Below is a brief outline of the first, the fourth, and fifth sub-cycles, which are the most relevant to the purpose of comparison with the general accounts of Kunika's remorse over causing the death of his father and his next rebirth. Regarding the first sub-cycle, the Shlamyapala Sutra is perhaps the best known canonical Buddhist text dealing with the, the salvation of Ajata Shadru, in which the story of his visit to the Buddha serves as a narrative frame enclosing a sermon on the benefits of being, of being an ascetic. The latter part, half of the story, which follows the Buddha's sermon, narrates Ajata Shadru's confession of, the patri of his patricide and his conversion into a Buddhist Upasaka by taking refuge in the Three Jewels. The Shlamyapala Sutra has come down to us in multiple versions. Almost all the extant versions, except the Chinese version, agree that although Ajata Shadru is brought to faith by the Buddha through the through a sermon, he is nonetheless hindered by his own patricide from making substantial spiritual progress during the sermon. As for the fourth, uh, fourth sub-cycle, prophecies of Ajata Shadru's future rebirth and his uh, political Buddhahood can be found at least in four Buddhist texts. So the four includes the following. In his commentary on the Samanyapala Sutta, Pradagasa tells us that as a result of visiting the Buddha and hearing the Buddha's sermon, Ajata Satu will be released after staying in hell for 60, 30 years and will finally attain Parinibbana as a Pakaka Buddha. Well, the Samanyapala Sutta says that Ajata Satu is hindered by his patricide from attending the Tamai during the visit. But it also shows that this hindrance is only temporary and that the visit itself has long-reaching benefits. By doing so, 
but it also shifts the emphasis from the obstacle caused by Ajatasattva's bad karma to the salvific power of the Buddha and of his teaching. Both are Suda connected in the Chinese Agotalika Gama and the Chinese scripture on King Ajatasattva's inquiry into the five most heinous crimes predict Ajatasattva's short, short stay in hell, subsequent release from there, continuous rebirth in heaven, and eventual political Buddhahood. In both texts, his future heavenly rebirth and awakening are said to be the karmic rewards for his faith in the Buddha and in the Buddhist Dharma in this life. Lastly, the Ajatashadru Pidri the whole Havadana, story of Ajatashadru's malice towards his father, that is the part of 45 of Kshemandra's Bodhisattva Avadana Karata, shows that after torturing Bimbisar to death uh, in prison, Ajatashadru feel remorse, feels remorseful and seeks aid from the Buddha, who then preaches to him a sermon on karma. The Buddha pre uh, predicts that if Ajatashadru abandons Eva and associates himself with the virtues, his sin will be extinguished in due time and that he will finally become a political Buddha. As for the fifth sub-cycle, prophecies of Ajatashadru's future rebirth and his eventual Buddhahood can be found at least in three Buddhist texts, uh, namely the Ajatashadru Kalkritya Sutra, which is a Mahayana text, uh, and the Chinese scripture on the prediction of future Buddhahood of King Ajatashadru, and the chapter uh, on the prediction of future Buddhahood of King Ajatashadru of the uh, scripture on the Tanani for protecting state rulers. Among these three texts, the Ajatashadru Kalkritya um, Venudana centers on how the Buddhist Bodhisattva Manjushri, through expounding the amplitude Chunyata of all phenomena, relieves Ajatashadru of his remorse, Kalkritya, over the patricide. The text shows that after hearing Manjushri's exposition of amplitude, Ajatashadru is almost entirely absorbed from the bad karmic consequence of his patricide. The text predicts that he will stay in hell only for a very short time, where, where and feeling no pain there, and that after emerging from hell, he will be reborn first in heaven, then as a bodhisattva, and finally as a Buddha. Lastly, in the Chinese scripture on the Talani for protecting state rulers, the Buddha assures Ajatashatra that due to his confession and repentance, he will quickly get out of hell after falling into it, and will then be reborn in the Tushita heaven, where he will receive from Maitreya a prophecy of Buddhahood. So the outline above gives a basic picture of the three most important sub-cycles of the stories of the salvation of Ajatashadru in Indian Buddhism. In the first uh, sub-cycle, most of the extant versions of the Shlamyapala Sutra, except the Chinese version, presents an overall balanced picture. On the one hand, Ajatashadru's confession and his taking refuge demonstrate the Buddha's personal charisma and the great impact of uh, the Buddha's teaching. On the other hand, Ajatashadru's failure to make substantial spiritual progress during his visit to the Buddha as a result of his own patricide evinces the inescapability of karmic effects. The situation is rather different in the fourth and fifth sub-cycles which predict his future political Buddhahood or Buddhahood. And in these two sub-cycles, through granting ultimate awakening and liberation to this seemingly unsavable criminal, the Buddhist authors of these prophecies demonstrated the temporary nature of a karmic obstacle to spiritual growth, the salvific power of the Buddha or Bodhisattva such as Manjushri, the efficacy of a Buddhist Dharma, and the overwhelmingly positive nature of Buddhist soteriology. In contrast to those Buddhists who claimed Ajatashadru's future liberation, the Jains seems to have shown no interest in granting ultimate liberation to Kunika. So let us now look at what the Jaina says about Kunika's reaction to his father's death and his next rebirth. In describing Kunika's grief and guilt over the death of his father, Jain storytellers made no attempt to have his sense of guilt resolved through religious me measures. They simply told us that Kunika gradually relieves himself of sorrow through performing worldly funeral rites for or 
offering oblations to his dead father, Shnanika, and through relocating his residence from Lajagliha to Champa, without mentioning the involvement of any, any religious figure. For instance, the Niliavariyao, the eighth Wupanga of the Shvetambala Canal, a text in its current form dating perhaps to sometime between 350 to 500 CE, narrates Kunika's reaction to Shnanika's death in prison as follows. You can find the quoted text at the end of the paper, so here I just read my translation. Then Prince Kunika came to the prison. He saw King Shnanika falling on the ground, breathless, motionless, devoid of life. Overwhelmed by the great sorrow for his father, he fell flat on the ground with a crash, like an excellent champak tree cut down by an axe. Then, in a short while, when Prince Kunika recovered, crying, lamenting, grieving, and wailing, he said, Alas, I am wretched, devoid of merit, and have made no merit. By me, an evil deed was done, putting in chains King Shlanika, who is dear, godlike, attached to me with boundless love and affection. King Shlanika died in my very presence, surrounded by lords, uh, city guards up to, because this is just a, a kind of cliche, up to the treaty keepers, crying, lamenting, grieving, and wailing with great pomp, honor, and assembly of citizens. Kunika, did, uh, Kunika removed the dead body of, his, of King Shnanika. He performed many worldly funeral rites. After that, Prince Kunika was overcome by the great suffering of mental depression. At one time, surrounded by his harem and dependents, with his vessels, utensils, and other household paraphernalia. He left Alaja Griha and went to the city of Champa. There, provided with an extensive range of worldly enjoyments, he seemed to feel little sorrow. A brief and somewhat different account of Kunika's grief over the death of Shnanika in the, is, is found in the Avasaya Chulani, uh, Avashia Kachulani, as uh, attributed to Jinnadasa a practical prose commentary on the versified uh, Avasaya Nichuti, Avashiak Nilukti, which itself is a commentary on the canonical Avashiak Sutta, Sudra, one of the four Mula Sudras of the Shvetambala Canon. So the Jina Dasa's Avashiak Chulani reads, Seeing Shnanika dead in the prison, Kunika became even more distressed. Then, having crem cremated Shnanika, he went home. Having given up uh, the concern for the burden of kingship, he started thinking about uh, Shnanika only. His minister thought the king is lost. Having engraved an edict, edict on a copper plate and made it look old, they presented uh, the plate to the, to the king, saying, thus should it be done for a father. He is to be saved through the offering of rice balls. From that time on, the ritual of offering rice balls to one's father became established. Thus, in the course of time, Kunika became free of uh, grave. But again, when he saw an assembly hall belonging to his uh, father with seeds, cultures, and objects of enjoyment, he felt distressed. And hence, he left uh, Lajaglika and moved to the Champa, made the Champa the place of uh, uh, his re re royal residence. In the, Hali Hali the Avashiaka Variti or Avashiaka Tika, written by Halipadla, which is a mixed uh, practically uh, Sanskrit prose commentaries on the Avashiaka Nichuti, gives basically the same account with only minor differences in wording. In his Trishash Dishalaka Pulusha Chalida, Hamachandra re retells this episode in a way similar to the accounts in the Avashiaka commentaries. And Hamachandra also, uh, like a, like a Jina Jadasa and Halipadla, Hamachandra also speaks of Kunika's offering of rice balls to Shnanika, his experience of uh, a uh, re-stimulation of sadness upon seeing the cultures and seeds used by Shnanika and his cons con consequent relocation from Lajagliha to Champa. In the Akhyanaka Malikosha uh, Vriti written by Amla Deva in the 12th century, a practically verse commentaries on the um, Akhyanaka Malikosha written by the Namichandra in the 11th century, we find a, another version of this episode in which Kunika is depicted as uh, initially blaming himself for the death of Shnanika and later gradually gave up grave, giving up grave. So, the, so Amla Deva's uh, Vriti reads, uh, King Kunika saw this situation, that is Shnanika's death in the prison, 
and was um, afflicted with remorse. His mind was uh, tormented by grief over the death of his father. He lamented uh, in various ways. Because the lamentation is very long, I just skip it. It's kind of, it just like a sing, uh, praise, uh, sing eulogy for Shnanika's various virtues. So let's turn to the next page, the end of last paragraph of this uh, quotation. In this way, King Kunika, whose whole body was overwhelmed with the unbearable grief over his father, was unable to stay there in Lajagliha. He founded the city of, uh, founded the city of Champa, and um, gradually relieved from grief, he became ruler of the earth, who conquered the entire, uh, entire tripartite world. Equipping, equipping himself with a four-foot army, uh, Kunika guarded his country. A relative late Shvetambala text, the Katakosha, of unknown authorship and perhaps dating to the 15th or 16th century, also shows that Kunika is mentally overwhelmed by the loss of his father, insofar as he refuses to bathe and to take food. But, but like uh, all the Jain versions we have seen above, so the, Kunik, uh, the Katakosha proceeds to tell us that Kunika finally overcomes his, own, his grave through non-religious means, which is uh, moving, to, moving his capital to Champa, or through some enjoyments of worldly this, this, uh, um, in pleasures. The fact that Jain storytellers did not pursue further Kunika's grief and remorse over the death of his father, but opted to have such emotions resolved through non-religious means, makes them radically different from Buddhist storytellers, who, as we have seen, made the sustained efforts to explore Ajat Shadru's repentance after sinning and proposed various Buddhist solutions to his sinful conditions. The Jains were, of course, fully aware of the sociological significance of repentance. The Shvanambala canonical text, Uthalachayana, uh, for instance, speaks of repentance as being conducive to reducing karmic bondage. Uh, and also as uh, uh, Professor Granoff observed that repentance is often highly valued in Jain didactic story collections, which contain various narrative illustrations of the efficacy of remorse and the confession in cleansing sin. Strikingly, the salvific value of repentance is not addressed in Jain stories of Kunika. While the Jain did show Kunika's repentance over causing the death of his father, he did, they did not feature this theme prominently, nor did they go a step further to explore the possibility of having Kunika's sin reduced through repentance or through any other means. The Jains did not provide any remedy for his bad karma, probably because they believed that there was no way to mitigate the bad karma Kunika has accrued from imprisoning his father with patricidal intent. In other words, Kunika must leave out the consequences of his own misdeed. According to the Jain story tradition, Kunika is killed by a cave deity and falls into the sixth hell. There seems to be no information on when he will be released from hell or whether he will attain liberation in the future. Accounts of Kunika's death and his descent into hell are mainly found in five post-canonical Shvetambala texts. Among the five, two are Junis or Julianese, that is, uh, practically prose commentaries uh, on the Dasavayaliya, Dasavayikarika Sutta, namely the Dasavayaliya Juni uh, written by Agastya Simha and the Dasha, uh, Dasavayaliya Juni attributed to Jina Dasa. The other three texts are the Avashyaka Juni attributed to Jina Dasa, Halipadala's Avashyaka Vritti, and Hamachandala's Drishasti Shalaka Purusha Chalida. And in all these three texts, the death of Kunika occurs immediately after his war against the King Chedaka of Vaishali. And the war break, breaks out not long after Kunika threw his father into Shnanika into prison, where Shnanika dies through suicide. Given this sequence, Kunika's rebirth in hell may be seen as a calamic retribution, both for his uh, military violence and for his uh, imprisoning of uh, his father Shnanika with a patricidal in intention. According to Jain, uh, Jain doctrine, wherever an intention to hurt or kill arises under the influence of passions, such as lust and, or hatred, there is a power himsa leading to the binding of bad karma. Jain narrative literature repeatedly shows that thoughts of violence, even without being manifested in bodily action, still incur 
severe economic consequences. In the case of Kunika, although the Jans spoke of Kunika's, uh, spoke of Shinanika's suicide instead of uh, Kunika's patricide, they did show that Kunika at least toyed with the thought of uh, murdering his father. Thus, even with the thought of patricide, Kunika binds much bad karma and has to undergo the punishment of hell. In China Das's Avishyaka Chulani and Haripadra's Avishyaka Vriti gave, gave basically the same accounts of Kunika's death and descent into hell. Since the narrative material in the uh, Avashiyaka Chulani is uh, usually considered to be older, I translate its account here. At that time, Kunika returns to Tianpa. The Swami, which is Mahavira, stopped as a holy, as holy assembly there. Then Kunika thought, I have many elephants and horses. Now I, now I go and ask the Swami, am I a Chakravalatin Chak or not? He went out in all pomp to the Holy Assembly. Having venerated the Swami, uh, Kunika said, how many Chakravalatins are in the future? The Swami said, all the Chakravalatins are passed away, which means there's no Chakravalatins in, in this time cycle. And, he, uh, no, uh, and he, he further asked, where will I be reborn? And Mahav, uh, the Swami said, in the sixth hell, even though uh, I'm believing, having had all the single sense jewels made in copper, Kunika went to the Timisa cave in all pomp. After having taken the eighth meal, the, the cave deity, uh, Gritamalaka, said to Kunika, the Chakravata things were all gone, go away. Kunika did not want to leave. He fastened his riding elephant. Having put his crown jewel on the head of the elephant, he went forth to strike the door of uh, Kritamalaka. And then he was killed by Kritamalaka and died going to the sixth hell, exactly as the Mahavira predicts. The text goes on to narrate the ascension of Kunika's son, Udain, to the throne without seeing anything more about Kunika. In his commentary on the Dasavayaliya, Agastya Simha gives a slightly different version of this episode. So the Kunika asks Swami, where, where do the Chakravata kings who have not abandoned the enjoyment of sensual players go after finishing their lives in this world? And the Swami said, they are reborn in the seventh hell. And the Kunika said, where will I be reborn? The Swami said, in the sixth hell. And Kunika said, why am, I, why am I not to be reborn in the seventh? The Swami said, a Chakravata king goes to the seventh. And the Kunika said, am I not Chakravata king? I also have 8,400 thousand elephants. The Swami said, do you have the jewels of a Chakravata king? And having had the artificial jewels made, Kunika started to accomplish his uh, military ambition. He set out to enter the Timisa cave, and Kritamalaka stopped him, saying, the 12 Chakravata kings are all gone. You are going to vanish. He was not, uh, Kunika was not held back and still stayed there. And he was killed by Kritamalaka and went to the sixth scale, exactly as uh, Mahavira predicts. So in both versions, Kunika is portrayed in a negative light. Overwhelmed by egotism, he disbelieves Mahavira's words, words and considers himself a Chakravata king. Eventually, he is killed by Kritamalaka and goes to the sixth, sixth scale, as Mahavira predicts. According to Jain universal history, there, there were 12 Chakravata kings altogether. Ten of them renounced their thrones to become Jain mendicants among whom some attended liberation and the others were reborn in heaven. The remaining two, namely Supauma and Brahmadatta, due to their unrighteousness, went to the seventh, that is the worst hell, and there is no mention of their ultimate liberation. In the present episode, through comparing Kunika with the two bad Chakravala things, not with the ten good ones, Agastya Simha apparently classifies him as a, a villainous tyrant ending up in ruination rather than a virtuous hero who is to attain liberation. In his uh, Trishashti Shalaka Purusha Chalida, Hamachandra retells this, this episode in more detail. And like uh, his predecessors, Hamachandra also keeps, si keeps, silence, keeps silent on what happens to Kunika after his uh, descent into hell. To date, I have not found any account of Kunika's failed destiny after his life in hell in Jain literature. Well, the, well, this does not mean that such account have, has never been composed. It does seem that the Jains in general were little concerned with whether Kunika can attain moksha. By contrast, in both the Shvanambala and the Digambala traditions, there are, there are multiple accounts of Shnanika's attainment of right view. In this life, 
uh, right view, which is Samyak Java, uh, Samyak Dalashana, in this life, uh, his next birth in, in hell and his following birth at the Jina, that is the first of the 24 Jinas of the future, next uh, cycle of time. According to Jain doctrine, in order to attain Samyak Java, the right view, a soul must have an innate quality called Pavyatva, which is uh, the capability of uh, attaining liberation. Not all souls have such a, such a quality, and not all the souls who have such a quality will realize their potential. Regarding a Pavya soul, a capable soul, pa Padmanabha Jani says, the Pavyatva can be aroused, thus initiating an irreversible turning of the soul towards moksha. Only when that soul encounters a particular set of outside conditions, while being itself sufficiently ready to respond to them, such a confluence of external and internal factors may or may not ever take place. Jenny goes on to cl clarify that here, outside conditions, outside conditions include, uh, in, among others, encountering a jina or his image and hearing Jen teachings. Whereas being internal, internal ready means that uh, the soul is relatively less bound and more oriented towards his, its own well-being. Thus, in order for its pavyatva to be activated, a soul must minima, minimize the passions, or, orientating itself towards the freedom of karmic bondage, and meanwhile must experience, experience necessary external conditions. If a soul is apavya, which is incapable of attaining liberation, who has no innate potential for liberation, or if a soul is pavya, but it but it's dormant, pavyatva simply never happens to be activated due to the lack of coordination of external and internal conditions. In either case, a soul always remains in a state of mityatva, that is a false view of reality, and never attains tamyatva. In the case of Kunika, although the Uvavaya, uh, that is Aupapatika, the first Upanga of the Shvetambala canon, narrates his uh, pious journey to Mahavira Samavasana, Holy Assembly, and his receiving of uh, uh, Mahavira's teaching there. No Jain text, as far as I'm aware, no Jain text ever speaks of Kunika's attainment of Samyaktava or any other significant spiritual status uh, as a result of meeting Mahavira and hearing his teachings. The Jains seem to have generally assumed Kunika to be one who is never able to overcome his Mityatva. It is unclear whether they considered him a Pavya soul or an Apavya soul. If they considered him a Pavya soul, the reason for the failure of, of activ activation of his Pavyatva must lie in his strong passions, as can be seen from his desire for the Chakravartin status and from his military ambition. And these strong passions make, the, make him simply unready or inadequate to respond even under the optimal external conditions of a direct contact with the Mahavila and uh, hearing his teachings. So to conclude, while both the Buddhists and the Jains told stories about how Ajatashatra Kunika imprisons his father and consequently causes his death, only the Buddhists provided religious solutions to Ajatashatra's sinful condition. The Jains, as seen from uh, extensive sources, made no attempt to tackle Kunika's bad karma from religious perspectives, and did not pursue the theme of his uh, remorse over the death of his father in much de detail. The Buddhists and the Jains uh, ascribed to Ajatashatra Kunika entirely different roles in their soteriological discourses. In the Buddhist traditions, as one guilty of the Alantala crime of patricide, Ajata Shadru represents one of the worst case scenarios in Indian Buddhist case ethics. Some Buddhists, for example, the authors of the various versions of the Shlamyapala Sutra, stress the hindrance of Ajata Shadru's patricide to his spiritual progress. Some other Buddhists, for, which is, for example, those, uh, uh, those who told or retold the prophecies of his future awakening, saw such karmic hindrance as being only temporary and moreover used his extremely miserable moral, thus karmic status, as a device to demonstrate the salvific power of the Buddha or Manjushri uh, and the efficacy of the Buddhist Dharma. In these prophecies, Ajata Shadru attains liberation not because of his own virtue, but because of the divine intervention of the Buddha or Manjushri and of the Buddhist Dharma. 
In Jain tradition, Kunika does not appear as a paradigmatic sinner as Ajat Shadru does in Buddhism. He accrues bad karma chiefly from his misdeed of imprisoning his father with patricidal intent and from his military violence. The Jains did not propose any remedy for his bad karma, which implies that, in the Jains' view, karmic consequences cannot be changed by any means. There seems to be no mention of Kunika's attainment of any spiritual status in canonical or post-canonical Jain sources. And there is little, if any, uh, almost no information on what happens to him after his next life in hell. The Jains portrayed Kunika, as I understand, essentially as a spiritual inert character who is unable to overcome his mitiatva even under the optimal, the best conditions of meeting Mahavira and hearing Jain teachings. In stark contrast to the Buddhists, who focused on the, focused on the intervention of external factors, such as Buddha, Manjushri, and the Buddhist Dharma, the Jains placed the primary emphasis on the soul's own qualities, inherent qualities, such as Pavyatva, Apavyatva, and to what degree it is sticky with passions. Thank you. Thank you very much for this extremely interesting paper. There is a lot of material there, very, very rich um, uh, communication. And yeah, we can see that your article is, is ready, basically. Uh, um, I would have myself a lot of questions, but I probably will open the floor first, um, because otherwise I will ask too many. Uh, so if there is any question, we, uh, we are a bit late. Um, so maybe we can take three questions and try to, to be not too, um, too much de delayed. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Luis, and then uh, Samani. Well, there is no mention about uh, Ajat Shadlu's aspiration to become a Chakravarti in the Buddhist context. And also in the Jain context, um, I didn't mention it because this whole story actually told within the, the Jain like, uh, universal history. Like, uh, and this, in the whole Jain universal history, the narrative framework within this big framework, uh, there are 12 Chakravartins, and uh, 10 of them are good Chakravartins. And the, the point I want to address is that here, the Mahavira only uh, mentioned that too, which implied that to go to, goes to hell. And the reason why the, that to goes to hell, because they are full of passions and uh, un unrighteousness. So, the, so the, 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 here, the, 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 the story seems to align uh, the two bad Chakravata things in comparison with uh, Kunika, rather than mentioning the, 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 the other ten. So the point here is that um, um, the, whole, the whole image of him in this story context is very, very negative and implying that he is such an a unrighteous, unrighteous figure and also full of passions, which, which, which become a hindrance for him to attain, attain liberation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There is no tradition not attempted by Mahavira or not attempted by anyone. Yeah. There is a contrast in tradition. Yes. That the even the lifespan of the Arta can be changed. So I think this is a change, like a big difference in the Dharma theory of Buddhists and the Jains. Yes. He actually, actually, the, the first draft I sent to Professor Peter Flugella contains the, the paragraph on the, on the, on the, the uh, 
unchangeability of the stay left, left, lifetime um, lifespan in of uh, of one's living in stay in the hell. But uh, if you look at the uh, Christy Vili, uh, and she has written an article on Shnanika's story, and she discussed that uh, in Shvetnambala traditions, the a person's lifespan, which is Ayu, a person's lifespan of staying in hell cannot be changed. But in Digambala tradition, there are some uh, kind of flexibility there. Mm, the overall picture is that uh, on the Buddhist side, we can see there are different uh, strategies of uh, shortening, uh, uh, adjusting Ajada Shadalu's stay in hell, try to make him quickly get out of hell or something. But on the Jain side, uh, the mechanism of the working of the karma, and the, because the Jain, in the Jain context, lifespan of uh, one's stay in hell is called Ayu karma. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, karma. That is, once it bound, it cannot be changed. So it's already fixed there. So the mechanism, the, the working of the, the karma, which co uh, the differences in the working of the karma causes there are different uh, uh, ways of handling the Ajata Shadru's existence in hell, which is uh, on the Buddhist side, it is possible to adjusting, and we can see many strategies to adjusting. But on the Jain side, within the Shvetanbada tradition, there is no way to adjusting. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. As far as I remember, Christy Vili, the, the she discussed uh, in the Shvetnambala tradition, it's uh, more rigid. But in the Digambala tradition, there are some uh, flexibility, as uh, uh, shown in the di stories of Shnanika. Yeah. Okay. So this. Um, exploration of narratives raises very interesting doctrinal issues, uh, and um, I'm sure we could discuss more, but we will try to, to stick to, to time.